neurological and cognitive dysfunction in ICU patients, a uh, little bit about prevention, screening, and long-term outcomes. Uh, so generally, I would start with prevention and screening and long-term outcomes, but unfortunately, we're at the space now uh, where we really only know uh, so much about uh, how patients are presenting, um, and long-term outcomes hasn't been uh, something that's been studied until recently. So I'll do long-term outcomes first, then talk about screening, and then some prevention strategies. Uh, when we think about risk factors that uh, contribute to critical illness, you'll see in the yellow boxes, the red boxes, and the blue boxes, um, they are uh, what um, happens at um, how we acquire uh, brain dysfunction. And in the uh, red uh, explosions is basically uh, brain injury. Um, and basically what's happening is that acute brain dysfunction is altered by all these things. Um, the systemic critical illness, risk factors, ICU environment, as well as medications. Uh, but basically, I'm just going to focus attention on the uh, long-term sequelae, uh, the neurocognitive impairment, uh, depression, uh, social and depression uh, function, and uh, a little bit about uh, neurodegeneration. So when does post-ICU uh, cognitive impairment occur? Um, first of all, it's actually most pronounced, uh, unfortunately, with attention, concentration, uh, processing speed, executive function, reaction time, and uh, working memory. So these are things that we generally need uh, to function in our daily lives, to perform our work, um, or our activities of daily living. Um, and unfortunately, uh, having a stay in the ICU of even four days or, let, uh, or more uh, can result in some cognitive impairment. Uh, but when does it occur? 70% uh, of patients actually have cognitive impairment at discharge, um, of the hospital discharge. Uh, there's su such a variety of um, ranges uh, based on the studies that are available, but at between 13 and 79% at three and six months, up to 79% at one year, and 25 to 40% at two years. So again, uh, cognitive dysfunction is really pronounced, um, and it's important to know that uh, when we take care of patients in the ICU, we assume that once they're discharged that someone else has taken care of them. Um, and it's unfortunate circumstances that uh, they have so many specialists after the discharge from the hospital that not necessarily is everyone putting all these pieces together. So it's important for us to start to get involved a little bit um, in understanding what happens to our patients after they leave the ICU. Um, in this particular study, they um, looked at long-term cognitive impairment after critical illness. This is called the Brain ICU Study, um, and they use R bands uh, as far as how they actually assess neurocognitive or neuropsychological status. And basically, a score below 100, um, the lower the value is the worse uh, um, global uh, cognition. And here you'll see um, in the light gray boxes is the three months. Um, this is a box and whisker plot showing um, age-adjusted global cognition scores. So the light gray boxes are three months, and the uh, dark gray boxes are 12 months. Um, the uh, normal score is up here. Um, it's at 100, and you can see they're all below, whether it's at three months or 12 months. Um, and it's an unfortunate circumstance that actually they um, have similar uh, reactions and uh, behavior and cognition as those with Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury. Um, the duration of delirium actually has a huge impact on global cognition at 12 months. So here, the longer uh, duration of delirium was independently associated with the worst uh, global cognition scores at 12 months. And you can see they, they measured it out um, uh, days off delirium. And actually, the global cognition scores, you can see, decline over time based on how long the patient was uh, delirious during their ICU stay. Uh, the study findings actually show that one in four patients have cognitive impairment at 12 months. It's similar to Alzheimer's patients. And one in three patients have cognitive impairment similar to traumatic brain injury. And I think uh, for us, when uh, patients are discharged from the ICU, we don't necessarily think about this. You know, once the patient is up and able to um, communicate to some degree or to eat, uh, they don't have needs to stay in the ICU. We discharge them to a general medical floor, and things continue to um, be altered in that particular setting. Uh, so again, when the patients are discharged, they still have some cognitive impairment that is uh, pretty dramatic in some patients. 
Um, in this particular study, this was a prospective cohort from the health and retirement study. So they were personal interviews. So when you think about the retirement study, you would assume that uh, patients are a little bit older. So the mean age in this particular study was uh, 76 uh, years of age. Um, and they basically use this, um, a survey. They track the patients over time uh, for certain symptoms. And basically, they found that um, after patients experience an episode of sepsis, their cognitive impairment was severely impaired. So you can see here, this was the survey prior to sepsis, and this is the survey after sepsis. And they did have um, significant impairment um, after a sepsis episode. They also had significant changes in their activities of daily living. So they looked at um, work, their ability to dress themselves, bathe themselves, eat, go to bed, things that we take for granted as uh, things that we should all be able to do. Unfortunately, you can see that in the, uh, the dark, the black lines, that there was some significant changes in their ability to take care of themselves uh, after an episode of sepsis. Uh, so severe sepsis was actually independently associated with acquiring one and a half new functional limitations. So there were some patients that had limitations uh, prior to the sepsis, and, and obviously that sometimes they'll actually get worse. Uh, but for those that actually didn't even have any limitations, they acquired uh, one and a half limitations uh, in relation to their ability to care for themselves. Um, in this study, there's a risk factors looking at persistent cognitive impairment after critical illness. And this was a nested uh, case control study. It was an observational case control. And the primary endpoint was uh, new and persistent cognitive impairment documented in three and six months. Uh, so this is the, uh, the diagram of how they actually uh, looked at the patients. So they had 98,000 ICU admissions. They had 21, close to 22,000. Uh, with cognitive impairment and 76,000 with no impairment. And once they uh, reviewed the inclusion exclusion criteria, they had uh, 2,400 uh, cases and 2,400 controls. And I know this is uh, not easy to see, but I just basically wanted to show you that um, there are multiple comorbidities associated with persistent cognitive dys dysfunction. And as you can imagine, the more uh, comorbidities a patient has, the more cognitive dysfunction they're likely to have. But they did do an analysis of adjusted and um, unadjusted uh, scores for those with uh, no cognitive impairment versus new cognitive impairment, and they found that scores had severity of illness, uh, length of stay in the, hospital, in the ICU, days on mechanical ventilation, their acute uh, brain function, as well as um, ICU stays with sepsis. They all were significant in the unadjusted uh, analysis, but when they adjusted for uh, comorbidity scores, days on mechanical ventilation, and their ICU stay, uh, those uh, with an, um, a high Apache score, long ICU length of stay, and acute brain failure, uh, so acute brain dysfunction, actually had um, significant cognitive impairment. So again, when we think about patients that we're caring for in the ICU, we don't always generate an Apache score in those patients. We don't really know what their score is, even on admission or discharge, unless the majority of the time, unless they're in a research study. But you know that if you have a patient who's in the ICU for a long period of time and they've had delirium for several days, um, they're likely to have, unfortunately, some uh, persistent cognitive impairment. So which patients are at risk? Uh, talk a little bit about screening, when to screen, and who to screen. And this is basically all new um, information because we really don't have the answers of uh, when this is appropriate. Uh, but there are some folks that are actually doing some uh, good work. Uh, so in this study, uh, published in 2015, they looked at physical, cognitive, and psychological disability following critical illness. And they found that there's a, a number of factors that actually contribute to um, some psychological and cognitive uh, dysfunction. So there are some uh, patient factors, um, things that happen after the ICU, some systematic uh, factors as well as ICU factors. And again, they fall into buckets um, as physical, cognitive, uh, psychological, and family burden. Um, it's important to know that uh, sometimes when we assess patients, I know that we have a, um, a number of patients in our ICU that are elderly. And uh, you know, in their chart, in their medical history, it'll say that they have a history of dementia. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell, is the patient delirious or does the patient have dementia? 
And again, when we look at the differences between delirium and dementia, uh, the risk factors for delirium are, are primarily um, either genetic, um, pathophysiologic related to infection, or medical due to some sedating medications. Um, additionally, it could be uh, patients could be delirious for the same reason we're delirious if we're sleep deprived. Uh, so again, when we're assessing patients for delirium, uh, generally it's a time limited um, event, and uh, patients with dementia generally have this as a, a chronic event. And again, they respond differently. Um, patients who are delirious have a clouded um, response, where patients with dementia ha are generally uh, quite alert. Uh, so when we think about some psychological outcomes, uh, we do have a number of patients that have a history of anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder. Uh, but sometimes when we're assessing the patients, we really don't take that into consideration. And having a critical illness um, can actually exacerbate those symptoms. Uh, we had a support group, an ICU support group recently, and um, one of our patients actually had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder at baseline. And they told us that when they were unable to respond because they were sedated but not fully sedated, every time a caregiver came in and touched them, they just went insane inside. They couldn't actually express what was happening, but it really um, came to a point where they actually thought the patient was combative, but no one really knew that they had a history of uh, post-traumatic stress. So again, if we're able to assess the patients and understand their underlying um, comorbidities, understand their symptoms of what their triggers are, we'll actually have uh, less issues. And then there's some reporting that actually uh, not really spend as much time as we should in pre preventing uh, psychiatric disorders in our, our patients. I know in our hospital we'll consult behavioral health um, if we have some significant issues. But again, the psychological outcomes and psychological issues in the ICU really do affect uh, long-term outcomes in these patients. Uh, so in this study, they looked at um, the sequelae of critical illness and the correlation with three-month follow-up. It was a prospective study, uh, six types of ICUs, and the patients had to have an ICU stay of 48 hours or more, and they did cognitive assessment at baseline in three months. And as you can see here, they measured um, a whole slew of things, uh, fatigue, uh, feeling down, anxiety. So again, a lot of psycho, uh, psychological issues. But they said, uh, the patient said that they really did not see any of these as barriers to recovery. Uh, so they were actually minimal. So uh, the way it was rated was zero was not a problem, where 10 was a significant problem. And here they rated these um, issues as not, um, not really significant. Whereas when we um, assess them for um, additional issues, strategies that were considered to be beneficial, uh, patient um, in, indicated that family engagement, medical visits, exercise, uh, and relaxation were identified as uh, successful strategies to aid in recovery. Um, and return to work was rarely reported as such. Uh, so again, when we think about um, the importance of family in recovery, um, We've had patients tell us that that was the most important thing to them, that their family was in the room, that they had pictures of their family in their room, uh, that they were able to connect and constantly feel as though they were engaged with their family. Um, and again, these were all considered um, significant um, steps in their ability to uh, recover. Some of the risk factors for cognitive impairment, actually, there are some risk factors that are related to pre-admission versus what occurs in the ICU. Again, it's not a surprise that um, advancing age uh, would contribute to cognitive impairment, uh, less education, um, some baseline cognitive impairment. And again, I showed you that screen with all the comorbidities. The more comorbidities you have, uh, the more likely you are to have some cognitive impairment. Um, there are some issues, again, with uh, the longer duration of delirium, the longer you're on mechanical ventilation. Um, episodes um, of uh, delirium as well as uh, severe sepsis um, can contribute to uh, a risk factor for cognitive impairment at cri uh, after critical illness. Um, there are some significant um, risk factors as well. Functional impairment, again, looking at age, the body mass index, uh, comorbidities, how frail the patient was even before admission. And a lot of times we don't really assess. We think about what patients are like on the way out. 
um, but they may not have been 100% functional on the way in. So we may not be able to, their functional status, getting them back to their functional status may not be to the same level for every patient. So understanding where they were uh, prior to admission is, is really important. And then again, uh, considering how many days that patients on mechanical ventilation in this severe cases are all important as well. Um, and this study actually looked at the uh, cognitive and functional outcomes after cardiac illness and found that uh, cognitive uh, dysfunction, frailty, comorbidities, again, in advanced age, really had um, significant impact in the patient's cognitive ability in the ICU, um, as well as 12 months um, after discharge. Looking at ICU delirium and, and ICU-related uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, this was published in, in 2017. And again, the risk factors for delirium, we had a lot um, that we talked about initially, um, so things that were preventable or things that were unavoidable. I mean, if the patient has a genetic dis uh, predisposition for delirium, obviously there's not much we can do about that. They have a history of alcohol use or tobacco use, a history of depression. Um, so those baseline factors, unfortunately, there's not much we can change there. Um, but as far as hospital factors, again, we, we did talk about some of the things that we can do. Um, some of the potential modifiable factors, if the patient has hearing or vision impairment, that's something we can do something about. So if we know they have a hearing uh, aid at home, we can bring that in. If they need glasses, we can bring them in. Uh, I had a patient tell us that you know, he was um, without his glasses for over two weeks and no one even realized that he couldn't read, he couldn't see anything. You know, They would ask him to point to things. He couldn't really do it because he couldn't see. So that's something we can certainly um, uh, improve and modify in the ICU. Uh, some of the things that we can also potentially modify are related to, um, you know, their baseline physiologic status, uh, not making sure the patients aren't hypotensive, trying to prevent sepsis, um, allowing uh, patients to sleep. Um, and again, some rooms don't allow light, so patients have no concept of day or night. Uh, so figuring out a way um, to get light into the room because patients um, can feel uh, deprived of uh, actually natural light. Uh, some of the risk factors for post-ICU psychological outcomes, again, uh, we have to think about the resilience of the patient before their, their critical illness. Not everyone has the same uh, underlying personality where they're willing to fight. Um, or they had the strength to overcome uh, challenges. So understanding the patient's resilience prior to their hospital stay is important. And I think the family members are helpful in that. And they'll say, you know, this person has fought through so many different things. Uh, they're going to pull themselves through this, and you have to feel confident um, that that is that patient's um, baseline. And then also having social support. Patients who have social support generally do much better than those um, that unfortunately do not have social support, not only in the hospital, but when they get home. Uh, so again, that's important as far as understanding the risk um, prior to even coming into the ICU. And again, ICU um, critical care risk factors, um, using physical restraints um, really impacts a patient, especially if they can't communicate, they can't tell you uh, what's happening. Um, we had a patient who had a trach, and he told us that he was so frustrated because he had a problem. He was feeling pain somewhere. He couldn't really communicate that because uh, he didn't have his glasses, so he couldn't read the board that they were showing him. Um, he had carpal tunnel um, disease in, uh, before his ICU stay, so he couldn't write. Um, and he um, had a trach, and he couldn't communicate. And he was a young man. We didn't find this out. He's been out of the hospital now for four months. Um, and he's doing fine now, but that's when we eventually found out. So during his whole hospital stay, uh, no one really understood why he was so anxious. And again, outcomes that we're concerned about are post-traumatic stress, um, anxiety, depression, um, family and social distress as well. Um, and unfortunately, their quality of life does uh, change significantly. So what can we do to prevent? Um, some of these issues, uh, so there are some strategies. We definitely don't have all the answers uh, because we do need a significant amount of research in this area. Um, this is a, a meta-analysis that was completed looking at um, ICU interventions to reduce cognitive impairment. And basically, they're saying that there was not enough evidence to support any of the interventions um, commencing during the ICU admission. 
So maybe the ICU stay is not the place to actually um, assess patients for risk or actually to implement um, strategies for improvement. Maybe the patients are just too sick at that particular time. Uh, but it's still important to, to note which patients are potentially at risk. Uh, so there's no particular um, intervention that has been studied. And you can see uh, the interventions that they, they looked at, enteral feeding, fluid, sedation, weaning, mobilization. Again, there's not a lot of studies in this domain, so there's still some work that we need to do. Um, and the other important piece is that all the studies that they reviewed here were all U.S.-based. Um, some prevention strategies um, in the ICU to improve outcomes, even though there's nothing specific, uh, that we still recommend that uh, we minimize delirium because there is research that says that um, the longer the patient is delirious, the more cognitive impairment. Um, apply the ABCDEF bundle, um, avoid hypoxemia, um, and avoid pathologic changes in blood pressure. So high blood pressure or low blood pressure and early mobilization. When you get patients mobilized or really engaged in their care, um, it's good for them mentally and physically. Um, it is a lot of work, uh, but I can tell you that it's, it's certainly worth the effort on uh, the part of the caregiver because they feel like they're really doing uh, some good work and the patient is actually actively engaged in their own recovery at that point. Uh, some of the strategies to improve ICU survivor and caregiver outcomes. We talked a lot about the patients, um, but it's important to know that family members also have um, some real challenges uh, when their family member is in the ICU. Um, and some of the psychological outcomes that we're looking at in patients, they also occur in family members, like uh, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Um, it's important for us to assess you know, how they like to communicate. Are they able to come to the bedside? Can we talk to them? Do they need to be on the phone? Um, are we giving them information that's appropriate? Um, we can offer them ICU diaries if they're the type of person that likes to document what's actually happening and they feel like they're actually doing something and that helps the patient when they're awake and alert. Um, but again, um, referring them to um, so a psychologist if needed. Um, again, this can be very stressful. There are some networks for uh, caregivers, um, family members, and they also can participate in uh, ICU clinics. So some of the future directions for research. Uh, we may want to look into um, you know, some survivors. Maybe there's phenotypes for survivors. Maybe there are to um, will survive critical illness um, just because their, um, their structure is built that way? Um, are there factors that um, contribute to positive outcomes beyond the ICU, like the resilience that the patient has, uh, their underlying personality is positive at everything that they do, and does that help them overcome uh, some of the challenges with surviving critical illness? Um, we also need to figure out what's the optimal time to measure cognitive, physical, and psychological disorders. If the ICU is not the right time, should we be doing this on the floor? Should we have the patients come back three months later and assess them in a clinic? Uh, we really don't have the answers uh, for that right now, but it's certainly something I think is worth um, investigating. And then ICU follow-up clinics, I think we need more trials. There are some clinics in the U.S. and Australia, and they feel that the people that are participating in those clinics feel like they're doing a really wonderful job. And then there are others who started clinics and kind of closed them down because they couldn't get patients to come. Uh, but when you talk to patients who survived years to months after, um, they all say that they kind of felt like they weren't being taken care of after they left the ICU. Um, and they kind of felt abandoned. So I think there's something that we need to do, but I don't necessarily know that we have all the answers now, but I think we just need to be aware. And this is something that was uh, published recently about, um, it kind of seems like a, a spaceship in a sense, but it's at uh, Brisbane's uh, Prince Charles Hospital Foundation, wanted to improve the, page, the um, surroundings for um, ICU patients and to decrease delirium. So this particular bed, it's called the um, ICU care cocoon bed. It has noise canceling technology um, so that they, the patients don't hear the incessant beeping. Um, it, stimu it simulates day and night, so the patients have a feeling of when it's daytime, when it's nighttime. 
um, and they also are able to actually video communicate with their family and pets at home. So it makes them feel like they're not so disconnected. Um, I know it seems like a, something that's probably far into the future, and I'm sure this is going to be quite expensive, uh, but it's nice to know that people are thinking outside the box of uh, what we can do to improve uh, the care for patients while they're in the ICU, thinking about what their long-term outcomes would be and hopefully eliminating uh, some of the challenges that they have. So with that, I, I thank you for your time. We had a, a short discussion on long-term outcomes. I tr hopefully try to identify some patients who are at risk as well as some prevention strategies. And thank you so much for your attention.